Ready, Bobby. All right. Just keeping the time. I am. Um, okay. Right. Hello, everyone. My name is Bobby Griffin, and today I'm going to be talking to you. Today I'm going to be talking to you about private prisons. Um, so my main claim is that the business practices of private prisons uh, encourage incarceration where it's unnecessary. Um, so to define a private prison, it's a it's a correctional facility that um, takes prisoners. Um, and it's a third party, and it's contracted by the government to do this. Um, some of the secondary points to back up my main point are that uh, private prisons have an incentive, incentive, incentive to maintain a high uh, prison population. My second point is that the local governments are under pressure to maintain um, to maintain final obligations. Uh, of their contracts with private prisons. And my third point is that the prison lobby advocates for criminalization of behavior. Um, it advocates for the, pr the criminalization of behavior that doesn't necessarily need to be uh, criminalized. Um, so back to my first point, which is that uh, private prisons have an incentive to maintain uh, high prison populations. This incentive happens to be money. Um, so it kind of this point it kind of outlines what the, the purpose of our prisons should be. Um, I think that the point of prisons should be to rehabilitate people and definitely take them take them out of our society and keep them separate. But they shouldn't be looked at as dollar signs. They shouldn't be looked at as profits for corporations. Um, so there's there's two big com corporations in America that run these private prisons. They're the CCA and the GEO. Um, they get a, a really big revenue from running these private prisons. Um, they get roughly $3.3 billion of, of revenue a year. Um, and they only these two groups only make up about half of private prison operation. Um, and the CEOs and vice presidents and presidents of these corporations receive a lot of money, um, so they're pretty much the money that they receive is like it's motivations for them to, to pretty much like prowl on, on citizens and like take them. They're like it's like it's like looking for an issue for for people. It's like looking for an excuse to put them in prison so they can get money. Um, and these vice presidents and presidents get like millions of dollars. They get like 1.5 million to like two million dollars a year. Um, and another issue is that the, it costs money to maintain these prisons. Um, and the CEOs and vice presidents and presidents, they tend to cut back on costs that would uh, go to like, to feed these prisoners and like, and give them a bed pretty much. They cut back on these costs so they can get more money, which doesn't really make sense. Um, I'm gonna move on to my second point, which is that the local government is under pressure to meet the financial obligations of their um, of their contracts. So this means that um, well they they sign the the corporations sign contracts with the local governments um, that pretty much guarantee that their prisons will be filled um, to ninety percent to one hundred percent capacity. Um, which just it just keeps things running efficiently for them. Um, it gets them the most money possible. Uh, some statistics: um, the United States has only five percent of the world population, but it has about twenty-five percent of the the world's prison population. Um, which kind of goes to the issue of mass incarceration. It's just America has a lot of people in jail. Like one percent of our total pop or the American population is in prison. Um, I'm going to talk about a scandal that occurred in 2008. It's called the Kids for Cash uh, scandal. This occurred in Pennsylvania. It was an issue between, um, I guess, it was the president of two youth centers. Was 
doing a, a deal with um, a judge who's giving him like they're he's giving the judge like millions of dollars to send these kids uh, to his prison, um, which wasn't which wasn't legal. Um, judges shouldn't be getting money to send kids to prison. Uh, my third point is that the prison lobby advocates for criminalization of behavior that doesn't need to be criminalized. Um, according to the Washington Post, the GEO and CCA, which are the two big uh, corporations, have invested $10 million uh, to, to, candid to candidates um, since 1983. Um, the two companies have spent about $25 million on lobbying, um, which means that they can they can push for for um, certain laws, I guess. Basically, the reason these corporations um, invest money to lobbying and to candidates is to adjust um, laws, like specifically laws about immigration and drug use. So. If there, um, if there are any proposed new ideas about immigration, these corporations would prefer to adjust the law to like keep as many people in prison just to keep the uh, flow of money going. Um, and that's my presentation. Thank you for listening, everybody. All right, Bobby, the organizational stuff is all fine. You've got a clear statement of the proposition, a good preview of what the supporting structure is going to be in the body of the speech. You signpost those points pretty well. Now, in explaining what the argument is, I think that's where we start running into some problems. Uh, you make a presupposition that there's uh, the focus of prison should be about uh, rehabilitation and not... Uh, anything else and I'm not sure why that is the case that's a value argument it's not it really doesn't have an appropriate place here uh, there's not an explanation as to why we have these uh, private groups uh, providing prison services in the first place and so I think without the context your argument is a little bit problematic uh, the claim that CEOs are making money off of the higher number of prisoners in there and there you make it sound like the CEOs are out there on the streets looking for people to throw into prison and that's going to put money in their pocket and I don't hear any evidence that suggests that's true. It's all asserted. So I think that's, that's problematic. Um, on the issue about they might cut down on the amount of money that they spend in the prisons, uh, I think there's a potential argument here. If, they, if prisoners, for instance, are being abused, they are not being uh, fed properly, they don't have adequate medical care in the prisons, in these private prisons, then I think there is an argument to be made that there is a, a problem, a conflict between the profit motive of the prison and the function it's supposed to serve. But I didn't see any evidence of that. I just heard an assertion that this could be what's going on or they might be motivated to do that. Um, there ought to be an example that you can point to and say, you know, this prison in Arizona Arizona has denied any medical services for the last 120 days as a way of making up the losses in the number of prisoners that they have, then I could say, okay, there's a clear abuse that you're talking about. But all I have is this assertion that such a thing is happening. Uh, the second point is clearly labeled. Uh, again, the same problem. There's a limit, uh, limited amount of proof on that point. I don't really hear a lot of evidence. I mean, I heard a description of what the... <coughs> uh, contracts call for. There wasn't a source on that. Uh, the one set of evidence that does get specifically presented is just about the size of the U.S. prison population, but it's not even the size of the U.S. prison population in these private prisons. It's just the whole prison population versus uh, the rest of the world. And again, we're back to this issue. There, if you want to make an argument that says we imprison too many people, that's a value claim. Uh, if you want to say that it's not necessary to imprison this many people, I think that's a, a claim of fact. But that's not the issue that you're, you're supporting here. You're just giving us background information on this. Uh, the Kids for Cash one, on the, I think, is probably a good illustration of an example here, except 
You yourself said it was illegal. They've been prosecuted for it, and uh, it's not right. So if it's illegal, it's not part of current practice. It's just a, a violation, and uh, somebody's doing that. That's okay. <laughs> so somebody broke the law, and they did something that they weren't supposed to do. By the way, I'm not. I don't. I don't know how much it is, but if they can afford to give millions of dollars to send a few uh, kids to this guy's camp. Uh, there's something weird going on there. I mean, somebody's got more, way more money than they need. Uh, they should send some of it to us. We could use it here. Uh, the third point, like I said, <coughs> uh, basically makes this argument about how much money they've spent. Since 1983, that doesn't sound like a lot of money. I mean, $10 million, that's pretty good for you and me, but that's uh, 35 years that you're talking about here, or 33 years that you're talking about here. Uh, that's not a lot of money over that period of time. And the notion that they've run around and, and criminalized some sort of behavior in order to keep their prisons full, well, which behavior? What example have you got? At best, you suggest immigration and drug laws. I don't know how immigration laws would apply. If somebody violates the immigration laws, they're supposed to be uh, taken care of by uh, Immigration Customs Service. Um, you know, and usually that means deportation, not imprisonment. Uh, the drug use laws are set by Congress. Well, some of them are set by Congress. So if you've got an argument that says that the uh, people here have intervened in Congress and that's why we passed some kind of legislation, you need better evidence that says that. This is just like somebody who has this theory or suspicion on this and that's what they've said, but they've offered no proof on it. So I think that's problematic. All right, thank you.